Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for that. So um, I'm going to be really talking about uh, using the development of um, point of care tests for STIs and AMR as an example of the usefulness of social science alongside lab science for tech technology uh, development and implementation. I can figure out how to progress my slides. There we go. So the four most common bacterial STIs are chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomoniasis, and mycoplasma genitalium. And you might have seen in the news over the past several years that a particular concern is uh, drug resistant or super gonorrhea. Um, but uh, a lesser known organism, mycoplasma genitalium, is also of concern for antimicrobial resistance. The gold standard for bacterial STI detection is nucleic acid amplification tests, which are, uh, which are necessitated by, uh, necessitate the uh, large scale centralized laboratories. So in the UK, um, we test for gonorrhea and chlamydia regularly using NATS, um, not so much for mycoplasma and trichomoniasis. In many low and middle income countries, and indeed in some high income countries, the facilities for NATS is limited because of the need for those large scale labs. But reliance on syndromic management, so the um, uh, diagnosis of these infections by, uh, by looking at signs and symptoms and um, uh, behavioral uh, aspects um, is uh, of risk is inadequate because these pathogens all have similar symptoms but require really different treatments. And as we've heard so far in the talks that incorrect suboptimal treatment has been shown to increase antimicrobial resistance and in STIs, this is no less true. Um, we've also heard earlier in Ben's talk, the discussion around rapid diagnostics and particular point of care tests have potential to reduce antimicrobial resistance. Although um, there is some debate about, about whether or not this, uh, this would work as a single use strategy I'm going to um, go forward with the uh, assumption that it will be helpful. So with all of that in mind, um, it, we, I developed a program of work that was funded by the NIHR and ran between 2014 and 2017 to help develop rapid point of care tests for STIs and antimicrobial resistance detection. And we were specifically looking at the potential for their use in specialist sexual health services here in the UK NHS. And so the um, issue was, so I worked with a company called Binks Health and they were looking to develop a 30 minute point of care test. Um, and they were looking to develop it for these four bacterial STIs, um, but also for uh, resistance detection for gonorrhea and mycoplasma. Um, the problem was is that they couldn't put all of these uh, detection assays onto one cartridge that would take 30 minutes. So with that in mind, um, what was the best way to configure these tests? And so my study uh, spoke to uh, clinicians in six different clinics, first to be able to understand what the current clinical pathways were for care and treatment, but um, then also to pose to them this question of which uh, pathogens and which configurations of antimicrobial resistance detection would be best within their clinical setting. Um, once we got those pathways, I then posed those to patients within those six clinics. And you can see on the map there, we did have some geographic variability. And there was also variability with different types of clinics. So some more uh, traditional and others using new types of uh, patient management systems. With that said, I'm going to present here just a very brief um, and simplified version of an existing clinical pathway, this traditional pathway that you would see in many sexual health clinics here in the UK, where the patient comes in for a consultation, their sample is collected, um, that is then sent to the lab, the results would be sent from the lab to the clinic in about a week, and then the results would be forwarded from the clinic on to the patient. Um, within that process, what you see is that a subset of those um, will be treated presumptively. Um, so with presumed infection, say if they have symptoms or they were a sexual contact of somebody that had tested positive for a specific infection. And um, then uh, 
uh, subset would also be given microscopy, so gram stain negative microscopy in clinic, um, but uh, which is not a very sensitive test, but quite a specific one. So um, uh, those that test positive via microscopy would also be given treatment in clinic. So along this pathway, the patient is released um, right after their consultation and their sample is collected um, uh, and their microscopy results are ready if the clinic uh, has microscopy facilities. So in this pathway, you see a lot of uh, over-treatment and especially along this line here on presumptive treatment. When we asked clinicians what their considerations for these tests were, they said, of course, that the sensitivity and specificity or the accuracy should be comparable to the existing lab NACs that they use. Um, and they felt that the multiplex test would be best at enabling better use of antibiotics. So their preference was to have all four pathogens on one cartridge with antimicrobial resistance testing on a separate cartridge. They felt that this would drive down presumptive treatment as well as drive down nonspecific diagnoses and increase treatment for specific infections, so more accurate treatment decisions. They did uh, advise caution. that They said that they would need guidance from the professional organizations, which here in the UK is the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV, in order to use these tests. And they especially had concerns around the epidemiology and emerging epidemiology around mycoplasma and trichomoniasis, which are less known because they're not tested for regularly here and also an understanding that changing treatment would have population impacts and had concerns about that. There were all sorts of questions around patient acceptability of these new pathways, um, and uh, specifically in this last one, whether or not they'd be willing to wait for results, which is super important because, of course, if the patient gets up and leaves before their results are ready, it's no longer a point of care test. So how would they change these pathways? Um, well, this is as if the uh, current care pathway would be exactly the same, except for you drop in the middle of point of care test rather than sending the sample to the lab. As you can see here, the patient then sits, is rerouted from the consultation and sits back in the waiting room uh, for about a half an hour until their results are ready. If the patient was found to be positive, then they would have a reflex test on, on a second cartridge for antimicrobial resistance detection, which would drive treatment decisions. Of course, this requires quite a lot of waiting, especially for those positive patients. So they also explored how this could potentially work um, in a little bit of a briefer way. And that was to have samples collected at triage um, so that the patient was not waiting less necessarily, but felt that they were waiting less because their result, initial result would be ready right at the point of consultation. So what do patients think about this? Um, they suggested that if they were concerned that they were infected, they'd be quite happy to wait and play for their results as long as it took. Um, so that it was really dependent on how they felt, um, which is not always the same thing as whether or not they were the most clinically vulnerable for infection. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. They really wanted guidance on changes to these pathways and realistic estimates of waiting times. And that was so that they could plan their visits accordingly. So um, they didn't think that they were going to just have a 15, 20 minute visit as was the norm previously. When we came to discussing about antimicrobial resistance, things got a little bit more complicated. Um, in some ways it was simple because they felt that their testing was tied to treatment delivery. So there's a high level of acceptability of waiting for results after receiving a positive infection result. So they would then spend that extra time to um, wait and be given their drugs before they left the clinic. So in conclusion, how useful was this? Well, we found that um, they were very, this was very useful in showing where importance lies for clinicians and patients for AMR detection capability for these tests, such as important benchmarks of a point of care test um, that should be passed and how they could be used within different patient groups. Um, they also uh, were very useful with patients in, in terms of indicating when and why they felt that they would wait um, and uh, how they, uh, what was of importance to them, particularly in, the, in that um, clinic process. 
They were less helpful for discussing AMR more generally. As I said, it became a little bit complicated because they really felt that decisions on treatment and when and where they received treatment was really going to be a medical decision made by a clinician. And that's something that they didn't have any control over. They had a lot of difficulty in answering questions on the importance of AMR and specifically around what AMR was, was and how it could potentially impact their life and their treatment. Um, most said that they felt that AMR was important once it was explained to them that it could potentially be a resistant infection that they had, but, um, but there was a high level of uh, potential acceptability bias as um, it, it was a very brief conversation and it, you would be likely to say that um, when somebody says that this is a global health problem. But um, this is one small topic and um, by this, I mean antimicrobial resistance under a larger topic guide where we explored many different potential clinical pathways. So a more focused discussion specifically on AMR might have yielded different results. Um, and what happened in the end? Well, with the company, the technology design lock was before we received our final results. Um, hearkening back to what Sassy said in the very beginning that um, researchers are slow and technology development is fast. Um, and this was driven by market concerns but important to understand that most of these tests are developed in iterations. So this research has greatly informed the next generations of tests, which are currently under development. And that's all I have for you there. Um, and I'm just gonna leave you with a link to the, uh, the published findings of the full report. Thanks very much.